They should be the most innocent members of society. But children can be capable of the most horrific, premeditated and violent murders. I thought they are so sadistic what they do to my son. Evil, just pure evil. What drives these children to kill strangers, their family, even their closest friends? I have completely blocked him out of my life. I've pretended like he has died along with Ellie. With access to police officers and their evidence. Charging a 16-year-old with, with, with murder is heartbreaking um, because, because they are children, they are kids. And the insight of a leading criminologist. When you render your victim less human, it's much easier for you to be able to attack and kill them. We ask if they're victims of their environment, or are they born evil? What sort of person can do that? We hear first-time testimony from the families of innocent victims. It's come back, through and through, and I hope they have a terrible time in jail, which they should, being child killers. As they reveal the devastating impact of losing a loved one. 20 minutes, that role it's OK, um, to go on. And, um, yeah, and she died in my arms. The 10th of March, 2019, London. Police officers have been hunting two teenage killers. Oh, he's through the conservatory. Through the conservatory next door. Police officers! Over here! Hands there, you mob! Police officers, get on me down! Get on your hands! Get on your hands now! One of the teenagers was 16-year-old Aaron Isaacs. Didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me that one of the one of the assailants was was 16. The two teenage boys are suspected of murdering 17-year-old Jody Chesney, who'd been stabbed while she was sitting with friends listening to music in a park. You could hear her screams. They were I've never heard them screams before in my life. They're like worse than horror movie screams. Detained! Got it? Yeah. yeah. Special murder. 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 Jody was a 17-year-old girl who was in the park on a Friday night, which should have been an every normal Friday night occurrence with her and her friends. Members of a drug gang, they targeted Jody and ruthlessly stabbed her in a case of mistaken identity. Like what they done was disgusting, and they don't deserve being thought about, you know. 16-year-old Aaron Isaacs was a runner for the gang. He gets used as a runner by a much older man, and therefore he feels invested in the drugs trade. This random attack on an innocent victim shocked the community and wrecked a family. No one could comprehend what's happened. It was so quick and so sudden and so senseless. Why, I remember saying, why Jode, not Jode? Paramedics rushed Jody to hospital, but she died on the way. I know that my face uh, would have been the last face she would want to see. And if I was there, she'd have felt safe. But I weren't. Jodie Chesney was born on the 18th of June, 2001, in Barking, Essex. She was painfully shy as a young girl. And I mean, it used to, you know, great on me, because I'm not shy. But she had this thing where she, it was just shyness. You know, she wouldn't say boo to her. Goes, behind closed doors, you couldn't shut her up. But when she went into primary school, uh, there was a teacher there, I can't remember her name, but she really brought her out of her shell. Like, she would sort of make sure that Jodie was included in things and like Jodie would have to stand up and say words in school and all that and that's sort of unknown for Jodie, she wouldn't want to do that stuff but a teacher sort of helped her out with the shyness um, and then she was fine, you know I mean past primary school that really helped her, sort of helped her socialise. Jodie's parents separated when she was six years old and she moved with her dad and sister to East London. 
I was a single father then with two kids. So um, I had to give up work and it was about a year of sort of readjustment. Um, and then so I got back to work and my mum would pick them up and I'd get, I'd get home about six. So yeah, single father for, for quite some time. Her extended family played an important part in Jodie's life, including her uncle David, a local church leader. It's a big family and, and, and continues to grow. Uh, we are a, a close family. We're not in each other's pocket, but we, we do see each other very regularly, particularly for celebrations. Uh, and we're in each other's houses quite often. At 16, Jodie joined a sixth form college where she was studying psychology, sociology and photography. She used to go up into London on her own with her little uh, tripod and the, and the camera that I got for her, take photos for her college projects. And she'd do all that on her own. And, and I mean, that's scary when you think about it back, going to London on your own. But that was the sort of girl she was. She was dedicated at school. She wanted to do well. She would meet her closest friends after she joined college. Well, she got, I think from the age of 16 onwards, that was their click. They had a group of friends, they're all a little bit quirky, a little bit weird, um, a little bit alternative. That's why I suppose they sort of gravitated to each other. She was honestly the kindest soul I've ever met. She, I don't think she had a bad word to say about anyone. And that was really different from a lot of the other people I'd met to have just meet someone so caring, no matter what. We had the same sense of humour, the same music taste. I knew that we were just going to be good friends, you know? Like, she was so random, like, she came up with the most random things, completely out of blue. But Jodie wasn't random about her future. I knew that she wanted to do something with photography, she was really into it. Um, she also did want to do something with animals, but she didn't know what, like... I'm pretty sure that she wanted to do something like animal photography or something, like wildlife photography. I think she probably would have gone, gone ahead with the photography, you know. She loved it, and she was good at it. You know, very good. So she would have done that, I reckon. Growing up in this part of the country was a challenge. The area's rough, no doubt about it. It's, it's a rough old area, but I'm used to it. I grew up here, and generally, they're good people. But like I say, the area's, um, yeah, there's a lot of crime. You, know, you fall asleep to the sound of sirens, and helicopters going up above searching for people. That's almost nightly. There's always something going on. It's, it's pretty rough. Inner city crime has exploded in recent years, driven mainly by drugs and the gangs dealing them. We know that young people from the inner city are going to be recruited and trained and exploited to sell drugs in towns near the cities where the drugs gang wants to uh, move into. That does mean, therefore, that young people are really going to be trapped by those drugs gangs. 19-year-old Svensson Ongakui ran a local drug gang in this part of London, and 16-year-old Aaron Isaacs worked for him. But running drugs for inner-city gangs carried deadly risks. Knife attacks have rocketed here. From my experience, unfortunately, you know, young kids are drawn into a, um, a life of, of violence and, 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 and drugs, which is what, you know, Aaron Isaacs was doing on, on the night of this murder. He was involved in drugs along with Svensson Ongakui. And it is really sad that that's what his life was, was around, dealing in drugs, which obviously brings its own misery to those that then take drugs and, and, and their family. Somehow they feel that by being part of the drugs business that they are going to make money, they're going to have status, that they're going to have greater success much more quickly than they would have if, like Jodie, they stayed at school, they studied hard, they went or would go off to university. So while these two teenagers were drawn more into a life of crime, Jodie's life was a world away. She'd done so much. She achieved the Duke of Edinburgh Silver Award. Uh, she was on path to sort of to, to get her gold. But the silver's quite a feat. You know, the Duke of Edinburgh silver's quite a feat. And she she done all the work. Uh, she loved it. I lost track of all the stuff that she was doing. Uh, she was always busy doing that sort of stuff. You know, she just loved to help people as well. She really did. She's the kindest person in the world. I mean, there's no one more true and kind than Jodie. So there's not an ounce of malice in her. Not one bit of malice at all. She liked to help people. She liked to be good, 
kind. She was funny. Jody had planned to spend the evening of the 1st of March 2019 with her mates, while her dad was planning his own night out in the city. The morning of the, the, the day that Jodie was killed, I um, was my birthday. So I'm having a coffee in the kitchen, same, t same as every day. Jodie pokes her head around the banister and says, uh, happy birthday, Dad. So I say, thank you, darling. And I shoot off to work. And it was the last time I spoke to her. As far as I know, it was just an ordinary day for her. You know, she did college, came home, had a shower, got changed, and then went out with her friends. Later that day, this CCTV showed Jodie and her friends walking out heading for a nearby park. It is the last known image of Jodie alive. And never in my wildest dreams was I expecting a call from the police. So, but yeah, it, it, it was just a roller coaster. And, and Pete just fell down to his knees. Um, I was just holding him and he was just saying, my Jodie, my Jodie, uh, not my Jodie. Those were his, those were his words. <laughs> On the outskirts of East London, 17-year-old Jodie Chesney was a popular young woman. She was about to sit her A-levels and was dreaming of a career in photography. She was kind of um, a proud geek, if you like. You know, she was always a bit alternative, purple in her hair and all that sort of stuff. And all her friends were all the sort of saying they wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of class her as the X Factor generation, if you like, where they all follow each other, they all like the same stuff. Jodie was very different in that way, you know. She had friends that were also kind of alternative, you know. Uh, all a little bit quirky, um, and so was she. But growing up in this part of East London was a constant concern for Jodie's dad. I believe it's definitely got worse, gotten worse with the violence. And, they, and the, for us to see the violence has got worse. You know, when I was in school, you had fights, you know, you had sort of three on one as well, but no one got stabbed, no one got killed. Um, there's always been fights, but now it seems people are just so uh, willing to use knives and hurt people and kill people, and it's, it's nothing, it doesn't matter to them, when it, it, it should. A common theme within a city crime is the exploitation of young and vulnerable people. You're seeing this all the time, is that young people as young as nine, eight and nine, are being targeted um, to come into gangs, and that's where they get them, really young. Um, new trainers, you know, a bit of money. Uh, that's how, that's what happens. Uh, and sadly, that continues. These kids um, that have not got uh, a stable family home, or have not got a father or a mother that's there to steer them in the right direction, are easily led, you know? They're easily manipulated by gangs. 16-year-old Aaron Isaacs and 19-year-old Svensson Ongakui were both already firmly entrenched in criminal behaviour. What I found interesting when I was looking at Aaron Isaacs was that he had a criminal record that went back to when he was 14. So we've got clearly, it seemed to me, a young man who isn't invested in school, doesn't see his future as coming from staying on at school, learning a trade. This is somebody who's going to be caught very quickly by older men who want to use him for their own ends within the sale and distribution of drugs. Six months before they killed Jody, Aaron Isaacs and Ongakui were involved in another violent incident. There was evidence in relation to earlier incidents that Aaron Isaacs was present at, which Fenton Ongakui admitted being involved in the stabbing of another young boy in Harold Hill the year before. Despite the police having knowledge of this incident, the victim didn't press charges, so no action was taken. But it did demonstrate the level of violence that Ongakui and Isaacs were prepared to use. What you're seeing is that the use of violence is much more uh, free now, is that actually it's, it's the first thing you do rather than the last thing you do. We're seeing the wide distribution of knives and the need for um, some drug gangs to be able to control their turf and the way that they control their turf against any competition locally or more widely is that they tend to use knives when they want to reinforce the fact that they are the supplier, they are the distributor in that particular area. On the 1st of March, Jody Chesney's innocent, carefree life would fatally collide with the violent world of Isaacs and Ongakui in Amy's Park. 
the park, it was basically just fields. Like, it looked like a lot of greenery. And there was one sort of small kids' play area. I wouldn't exactly say small, but obviously I think because we were bigger, it looked small. And, you know, it had like a sort of climbing frame thing and maybe a few, it had some swings on one side and then there was just two benches. So it was just quite a nice little area for us to sit in. I think that's normally where we just went and sat. Once college had finished for the day, Jodie came home to change before heading to Amy's Park with her friends. She was caught on CCTV, walking along the street at 10 to 6 in the evening. In the city, her dad was enjoying his birthday celebrations with workmates, friends and his brother. I just started a new job uh, in November. Uh, so I was sort of three months in and um, it was a sales position and I was really going for it. You know, it was, it was such doing really, really well, really succeeding with the job. I was over the moon with that. You know, I got a huge pay rise. Everything was going beautiful. You know, everything was, couldn't, have gone, couldn't have been going better. So I left work, straight to the bar. My friends came down, my, my fam, some of my family came down. And um, yeah, we was just celebrating a birthday with a few drinks. Nothing, nothing new there. Everyone was having fun. Uh, it, was, it was a great time. We were having good conversations. Um, the drink was flowing. I wasn't worried about Jodie. You never really had to, you know? She was so sensible. She was always with her friends. You know, I mean, I know it was dark and they were out quite late. They were out sort of nine, half nine. But that wasn't out of the ordinary. You know, they should be able to sit in a park. It wasn't that late. Jodie's friend Clarice was last to arrive. It was very, very dark when I got towards the park. I have to admit, I put the flashlight on my phone so I could see where I was walking because I've not got the best eyesight and I know if I'd fall o fallen over, they wouldn't have shut up about it. And originally, I didn't know where everyone was because I could hear the music that was being played, so I knew they were in that direction. But there was people sitting on both benches. We are sitting there, we were all having fun and stuff. Um, and... Basically, there was two people sitting on the bench opposite us. And I was like, you know what, they're just sitting there, you know? But they, they did look a bit sort of dodgy, you know? They were like looking back at us, they weren't even speaking to each other, they were both on their phones. Every now and again, they would turn around and look at us. In the city, the celebrations were winding down. And now and again, Pete and I would have deep conversations, usually when everyone has gone. And so we were doing that, we were having good conversation. Uh, about life, about philosophy. Uh, I think we're talking about faith as well. And, and it was, it was all, all positive stuff. Two people left the bench. There was two people sitting opposite us on the bench. Um, they weren't talking at all. And they were just basically sitting there every now and again, they'd turn around and look at us. And they got up and walked away. This was actually like one of our last conversations. She nudged me, just like, she literally just nudged me and goes, hey Faye, do you see a face in a tree? And I was like, what? And I looked up at the tree, I was like, I see what you mean. And I think we went quiet for like maybe three seconds. And then there was just like, I don't know, sort of a scuffle. You heard a bit of a scuffle and then Jodie started screaming. Like she shivered and jolted. Like, like someone had just poked her back. Or like someone, someone had just touched her back and you know when you get the shivers. Jodie started screaming, I stood up, I looked around. Gone, oh my God, has she been stabbed? and I freaked out sort of thing. Everyone's sort of freaking out. In the dark, Jodie's friends tried to help. And you could hear her screams. They were, I've never heard them scream before in my life. They're like worse than horror movie screams. Like you don't ever expect it to be that much, but it, it was scary. And then I think we were all sort of screaming, everyone was screaming for help. Amid the darkness and the confusion, someone called an ambulance. By that time, Jodie had went quiet. She was, she'd went quiet, and that's what had worried everyone a lot more, I think. I think because when we could hear the screams, she was screaming, you could tell she was in pain, but we could still hear her. And I think when she went quiet, everyone sort of, I think it, the shock hit in a lot worse. An ambulance arrived, followed shortly by the police. So the officers arrived, um, and they found Jodie, and they found Jodie's friends all very distressed and very upset. Um, um, ambulance arrived um, to provide, obviously, um, first aid and, and, and try and help and treat Jodie. Jodie's injuries were so serious, paramedics decided she needed to go to a major trauma unit. 
The nearest one was the Royal London Hospital, around 30 minutes drive away. Not far from there, Jody's dad's party was interrupted by the City of London police. I got a call about, about 10 o'clock, I think, um, to say that Jody had been attacked and we're coming to get you. I was like, whoa, wait, what? Um, yeah, so, and, and that's all they told me. <clears throat> Jody's been attacked, we're coming to get you. So obviously my night just went, changed completely. And so we just needed to leave and they would send a van, uh, city police would come and collect us. And we were frantically trying to find out some more uh, information about that, but, but nothing was there. So look, you stay there, uh, city police are gonna come and pick you up. <clears throat> and so Pete and I just waited, it wasn't long, and we got in the van. To be honest, that bit was all a bit of a blur, but the police van turned up, said, you Mr Chesney, yes, please get in the van, your daughter's been stabbed. I'm like, what, what? Um... Jody was then taken by ambulance to hospital. Um, unfortunately, en route to hospital, um, they had to perform um, emergency treatment um, because of her condition deteriorating. Um, and unfortunately, um, despite the best efforts of um, the medical services, um, they weren't be able to save her. So we're in the back of the van. Sorry. And I hear on the radio that please reroute Jody's dad to home because they were taking him to the hospital initially. But they said reroute, reroute Mr. Chesney back to home because we've lost her. So I heard that in the back of the van and, and just dropped to my knees. I couldn't believe it. It all went a bit mad uh, in the van and, and Pete just fell down to his knees. Um, I was just holding him and he would just say, my Jody, my Jody, uh, not my Jody. And those were, his, those were his words. And they operated on her uh, on the forecourt of the garage. Um, heart operation. Uh, it, it, she died of um, hemorrhage and, and trauma. So, but they were trying to, I think, I think they opened her chest up and they were trying to save her, but she died right then and there. They went a long way through the darkness into that park and stabbed a young girl in the back. Um, and the knife almost went through her. Um, and that's just, you know, even now it's just horrific to even think about. Jody had no enemies and had never been involved with crime, leaving her family in a total state of shock. No one could comprehend what's happened. It was so quick and so sudden and so senseless. Why, I remember saying, why Jode, not Jode? Now a huge police investigation would begin and it would reveal that two teenagers, one of them just 16 years old, were responsible for Jody's senseless killing. They've now had their lives ripped apart by the actions of these people and their lives are never going to be the same. The lives of, you know, Jody's family are never, ever going to be the same. On the evening of the 1st of March, 2019, 17-year-old Jody Chesney was stabbed just once by unknown assailants in Amy's Park near Romford in Essex. Jody's dad and uncle had only heard that she died while being rushed by the police to be with her. So instead of going to hospital, the police drove them home. Probably the hardest, one of the hardest things that we did, just sitting there, knowing that we'd lost Jody. And even though we were together, probably being as lonely as we could, um, even though we were all together, um, it was a lonely place. Pete did thump inanimate objects, thankfully, um, although the walls wouldn't have been uh, uh, taken kindly to it. Uh, so, so Pete is that, is that sort of person. It's a lot of anger. Obviously, horrendous sadness. But I mean, I turned on the policeman and all that, told him to said a few words to them, and, and, and I was angry. I, was, I couldn't believe it. I was punching the gate. Um, just manic. Jody had never been involved in any form of crime. It seemed that the attack was totally random. She was a kid in the park. So not really the wrong place at the wrong time, really, is it? It's, I don't really understand that phrase, but they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They shouldn't have been there. She was perfectly within her rights to be there. 
the police faced a monumental task to find Jody's killers. We had no leads, no identity of the suspects, um, and, we, and we had no motive for why this has happened, and they're the things that we really need to, to, to progress the investigation. And that just kept flashing through my mind is, you know, oh my God, how, how are we gonna solve this, you know? There's a number of things we would look at in terms of obtaining evidence, but it was just, at that initial point, it was just gonna be very, very difficult to find out who was responsible. Crime scene photographs from the park reflect the chaos that ensued after Jody was rushed away. The scene itself was huge. So the officers had cordoned off the whole sort of playground and park area. So the scene itself was quite, quite big. Um, and, um, but it was quiet, it was eerie. Whilst there was a lot of media there, and we had obviously, we had officers, men in the cordons and the crime scene, and there was local residents sort of watching from outside. It was quiet. But the area was, was, was huge, and at that stage, we had no idea who was responsible. As the investigation was ramped up, Peter had the trauma of having to say goodbye to his daughter. I saw her in the mortuary. I went to see her. She looked asleep. Uh, you, you could tell she wasn't there, but uh, she, she kind of just looked asleep, you know, so me, my daughter and my mother went into the mortuary together and she was behind a glass, laid on, on a you know, bench. It was horrible. While the Chesney family grieved for their loss, detectives made their first breakthrough when a new witness came forward. Late Saturday afternoon, early evening, um, we were made aware um, that a member of the public had contacted um, Romford Police Station um, to report he'd seen a black car, a small black car, um, parked with its headlights off. Um, and he then saw what he believed two figures run from the park and the playground and jump in the car and then the car sped off. He said he was very good at cars and he was a car enthusiast. Um, and he gave us the year of make of car. He thought it was a, um, a Vauxhall Corsa and he believed it was potentially an 08 year, 08 plate. Detectives studied several of their cameras in the area, and after looking through thousands of records, narrowed the search down to a handful of Vauxhall courses. Then they had a stroke of luck with an incident just two and a half miles away from Amy's Park. Then a black course was found, um, or was, was involved in an incident in Elbert Avenue, Kidman Close. The vehicle had been left, um, left at that location. Um, so I arranged officers to go there as quickly as possible. Um, and fortunately for us, the vehicle was still in situ. It, um, no one was with it. So we treated that as a crime scene. Um, the vehicle was subsequently recovered to a forensic car pound and, and then subject to a forensic examination. Could this black Vauxhall Corsa be the car that carried the killers to and from Amy's Park? It was just too much of a coincidence. Um, at, at that point, we still didn't know that that was the car that was involved in the murder of Jody. Um, but, you know, you know, call it gut instinct, call it inkling. The car had been abandoned on the road following a botched drug deal. The owner was quickly traced and arrested. Telephone records indicated that he, he was on his phone um, at or near the, the time of the murder and, and that he, would, he was involved, he was then in contact with other people who we then subsequently suspected of being involved in the murder. Though the driver of the Corsa denied involvement, his phone showed contact with a teenager called Svensson Ongakui. Detectives quickly tracked him down. We knew that Svensson Ongakui was living at a hostel in, 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 in Rumford, and when officers went to the hostel, um, he wasn't there. One of the things in terms of working with uh, young people who get caught up in the drugs trade is that they start out imagining that they're going to be like Scarface. They start out thinking that they're going to be major drug dealers, driving fast cars, earning huge amounts of money. If you think about Svensson Ongakui, he was hardly living the high life. He had no permanent address. He was living in hostel accommodation. He basically had very little. A witness had told police that one of the attackers wore a particular type of coat. We recovered CCTV of the hostel on the night of the incident, which showed us that Svensson Ongakui was wearing um, distinctive clothing in, in that he had a jacket on or coat on with fur, fur hood. 
and then detectives unearthed CCTV from a local cafe that showed Ongakui meeting with the driver of the Corsa on the day of the murder. He can be seen here with the fur-lined coat that matched the description by the witness. So police kept looking for him, and nine days after Jody's murder, eventually found him at a house owned by the relative of a 16-year-old boy called Aaron Isaacs. Harish. He's on that roof left. As officers went into the address, both Svensson and Aaron Isaacs um, went out the back of the house and Aaron Isaacs tried to go over the back fence of the garden and Svensson and we climbed onto a conservatory, um, which he then subsequently fell through. Oh, he's through the conservatory. Through the conservatory next door. Police officer! There we are! There At that point, Svensson was arrested for the murder. Detained! Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Special about murder. Murder. Though officers had come to arrest Svensson Ongakui, they also came across Isaacs. And when Aaron Isaacs was detained, he claimed not to know anything about whilst, why the police were there or what Svensson may have been involved in. But providing shelter for their main suspect raised police suspicions. So um, because at that stage we didn't know who was involved in the murder, um, we took the decision that Aaron Isaacs would be arrested for assisting an offender um, which would allow us to obviously question them around their knowledge of the murder. But detectives found no firm evidence on Isaacs, so he was released on bail. Hence, his face is blurred in this footage. But the evidence against Svensson was conclusive. Forensics had found a palm print on the bonnet of the Vauxhall Corsa. It matched Ongakui's. Because of the telephone links and the forensic evidence linking him to the Corsa and the distinctive um, CCTV clothing we, we, that we could obviously witnesses had described, um, he was subsequently charged with murder and remanded in custody. With Aaron Isaacs back on the street on bail, police continued to study CCTV. They unearthed footage from local shops showing Isaacs and Ongakui getting into the Corsa a short time before Jody was killed. And we saw um, Aaron Isaacs and Svensson Ongakui getting out of a taxi outside the hostel and then they both walked off down the road where we would be able to show that they were then collected by the Vauxhall Corsa. Um, the evidence was overwhelming. 16-year-old Aaron Isaacs was re-arrested and charged with murder in May 2019. Charging a 16-year-old with, with, with murder is heartbreaking um, because, because they are children, they are kids. Um, I mean, from my experience, unfortunately, you know, young kids are drawn into a, um, a life of, of violence and, 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 and drugs, which is what, you know, Aaron Isaacs was doing on, on the night of this murder. Their relationship will be particularly important, it seems to me, to be deconstruct moving forward, because it's almost as if you get a folia de. It's almost as if you have that classic madness shared by two, whereby one more dominant personality, I would presume Onga Kui, is able to convince the subservient personality to adopt his lifestyle and to see that lifestyle as being vital, important, and status driven. They're going to be in prison for so long that um, you know, they're not worthy of my thoughts. I don't hate them because in order to hate someone, you have to care. I don't care about them. I don't hate them. I don't care enough. They're scum. They're scumbags, through and through. And I hope they have a terrible time in jail, which they should, being child killers. She did nothing. There was no altercation, no confrontation. Um, this guy just decided upon it. Um, and what a cowardly thing to do. Imagine that. You stab someone in the back, a child. 17-year-old Jodie Chesney was stabbed once in the back by two unknown attackers. She died at 10.27 p.m. on Friday the 1st of March, 2019. 
Her best friends were with her that night. To hear the words, Jody is gone, I don't know, my whole world sort of shattered because we may have not been as close as we were or we may not have known each other for as long as she knew someone else, but in the small time we had, we became quite close. It was more sadness than anything, you know, like, because I've known her for so long and we had all these plans for the future and, like, she told me her plans for the future about, like, having a family and stuff like that. It was just more like, it's more upsetting than anything else. I was a mess. I will, I'll, I'll admit that now. I didn't like to admit it before, but I, I was a huge wreck. I think when happiness just gets taken so suddenly, I've never experienced that. After painstaking police work, 16-year-old Aaron Isaacs and 19-year-old Svensson Ongakui were charged with her murder. Six months later, their trial began at the Old Bailey in central London. The family and friends, it meant coming face to face with Jodie's killers for the first time. I've never had anger or hate for someone, and I've never had my blood boil so much, because especially Aaron Isaacs, he had a face of innocence. When you are that young, because we were young, at 17 you are young, when you have a face like that, you don't expect that young face to be connected to someone that's brutally murdered someone. I went for the first three days and I didn't go, I didn't go again until the verdict because it was so difficult uh, to see them trying to wriggle out of this and lie. When we knew from the evidence that the police got that they were there, I saw Svensson blame Isaacs I saw Isaac's blame Swenson because they, we knew they were both in the park, right? So uh, our prosecutor put a question to him and said, did you stab Jodie? He said, no. He said, do you know who did? He said, yes. I was like, whoa, what? Who? And he pointed to Aaron Isaacs. Um, so he tried to blame his uh, colleague or his whatever. But you like I say, I did the first three days <clears throat> and I knew I wouldn't be able to do it. And, and Jodie wouldn't want me to sit there and put myself through that. It's, it's a horrible experience, you know, uh, and it was killing me. Jurors heard how Aaron Isaacs and Ongakui were looking to take out a rival drug dealer who was encroaching on their turf. The prosecution claimed they mistook Jodie and her friends as their rivals, stabbing Jodie in an unprovoked ambush. I think everything points to it being a case of mistaken identity. They've now had their lives ripped apart by the actions of these people, and their lives are never going to be the same. The lives of, you know, Jodie's family are never, ever going to be the same. After just five hours of deliberation, the jury found Ongakui and Aaron Isaacs guilty of Jodie's murder. Two other boys were acquitted, along with the driver of the Vauxhall Corsa. It was a relief, definitely. I mean, there were so many tears outside the court. The police were crying um, because they're, they've invested so much into this case and they're, they're, you know, they know me, they know my family. You sort of, you get a relationship going. Um, but relief is the word. One of the saddest aspects of this was that neither any of the people involved in this murder showed any remorse. Either when they were arrested, they just shown contempt, contempt for the law, contempt for what the, the, the devastation they'd caused. They denied it, they denied involvement, they denied knowledge. They had to force our investigation team to prove everything. We had to look at every piece of evidence, gather as much evidence we could, whether that's CCTV evidence, whether that's forensic evidence, whether that's any telephone evidence that we used in the trial. On the 18th of November, Svensson Ongakui was jailed for life with a minimum term of 26 years. Aaron Isaacs, who turned 17 while in custody, was sentenced to 18 years. I just hope that the sentences that these boys got um, gives them time to reflect on it. Um, I'm not so sure it will, though. Just seeing their attitude throughout the investigation and throughout the trial, I still don't believe they've taken responsibility for what they were involved in. You know, like, what they've done was disgusting and they don't deserve being thought about, you know? Like, they're in prison now, they're, they're doing what they need to do, whatever else. But I obviously hate them, you know? 
But I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. They're behind bars, they're doing like they're serving their time, whatever. The tragedy is simply that we have to be able to hold on to these young men for much longer periods of time in school, because if we can do that, then we make inroads into a pernicious culture that would simply try to exploit young people for that culture's own ends. And I'm talking there about organized crime and drugs. Now, Jody's family are doing everything to keep her memory alive. I want to sort of create a, a, a legacy, if you like, for Jodie. You know, I want to do something good in her name because she was so good and kind to people. I want to sort of carry that, that kindness on as if it's her doing it, do you know what I mean? So the Jodie Chesney Foundation was set up and registered. The foundation was formed to help and educate parents and young people about the danger of carrying and using knives. Because I know the impact that losing Jodie's had. If we can say, if we can stop that even for one person, then all this is worth it. Jodie's murder was a completely random attack, but there are elements of the attack which reveal a much broader picture about what's happening in our towns and cities across the United Kingdom. Some 300 people were fatally killed through stabbing incidents in 2018. Now that's a huge number of people who are going to be murdered. But it isn't just a police's problem. It's, it's a, you know, we need a public health approach to, to knife crime. It needs all the services, all the agencies. We need schools, we need parents. We need everyone to work together. You know, it's not just a police that can, can stop knife crime on their own. Yet another knife attack in the UK had snuffed out the life of an innocent victim. Jodie's family and friends are left only with memories. She was amazing. She was the sweetest person I've ever met. She had a full-on heart of gold. She, oh, I don't even know how to explain it, because I've never met someone as good as her. And I don't think I ever will, just because she was so unique and so different, but in all the right ways. When I think of her, uh, and I've got a picture in my head of exactly what she looks like, and that doesn't go away, uh, and it's her holding Woody uh, and smiling, her, her geeky smile. And so that's the picture I see, someone who is happy, someone who, who lived life to the full, uh, someone who loved people and loved animals and would do anything for you. Uh, and that's the, that's the sadness of this, is that uh, whilst it makes me happy that I can think of her like that, it also makes me sad that she's not here. I would have said to her, don't worry, you're going to be fine. I would have reassured her, and she would have believed me as well. The last person she would have wanted to see was me, and I wasn't there. That killed me. Beautiful.